The next SIG meeting coming up will be concert photography, uh, Dave Bush, uh, shooting in low light, no light, uh, action uh, works there too. Again, we are on Instagram now, our CPS Instagram page. Uh, email your images, any images you want. We have quite a few followers now. Um, just email your images in JPEG form to social media at clevelandphoto.org and Steve Milner will put them up on the uh, Instagram page. The, all of those who are at the Holiday Lights field trip downtown, we need pictures for our website for the field trip uh, images. So if you were down at the Holiday Lights um, group there, email any of your images to info at clevelandphoto.org and we will put them up on the website for our field trip gallery. Upcoming exhibits, Beachwood Library, that is open now on Shutterscore to submit. Uh, the theme is going to be motion. There's more information about that on our website under the exhibits page, but that is um, open for submissions now. And of course, we are getting real close to starting our schools, the winter session of 2024, Fundamentals of Good Photography, um, Intro to Photoshop Photo Editing and Intermediate Photoshop Photo Editing. Lightroom Classic will be in the spring too. So there is still time and still positions available. If you want to sign up for that, you sign up again through our website. And uh, again, you're going to get sick of this, but I don't care. I want you to hold that date. It's in January. It's coming closer. It's a Saturday. It is our Cabin Fever Party annual event. Um, it'll be a potluck, but this year we're going to order extra food too. Prizes, robber's auction, annual tradition. Uh, this is from last year's party, so uh, definitely sign up for that. Um, or, you know, put that on your day. That, that is me, yeah, I, <laughs> in, in my younger days. <laughs> and as always, um, our Friday night meetings, our, our regular ones, everything except the Zoom uh, presentations. The Friday night meetings are broadcast live on our YouTube channel um, and are kept up there. You can get that by clicking on the YouTube icon on our website. And when you get to YouTube, click on live, which is counterintuitive. Um, and that takes you to all of our presentations in date orders. Any of the Zoom presentations you're looking for, they're on our website under the members portal. You just sign in and can see all of that. So that is it. And so uh, enough of me, let me introduce you. We're lucky enough tonight to have um, uh, Mr. Sportelli here, uh, who is going to tell us all about him. Go ahead, Luca. Hello, Fill everybody. Hi, my name is Luca Sportelli. And first of all, I wanna thank uh, Kim and Richard for having me here. I uh, was very, very honored when Kim reached out to me and asked me to speak about my life experience and how I went from a small town in Italy, where I'm from, to becoming a professional ballet dancer and moving into the United States, and then from there trans transitioning into a career as a dance and portrait photography here in Ohio. So, as probably everybody guessed already, I'm originally from Italy. I was born uh, in Italy. I'm 27 years old. And uh, I was born in a very, very small town in the south part of Italy, uh, in a small city called Nochi. And it's in the southern part of Italy, in the hill of Italy, the region is called Puglia. Um, I was born in a family of three boys, and I have an older brother and a younger brother. And <coughs> my mom and dad, I believe they did a great job on raising us and, uh, you know, making us the people that we are today. Uh, I always knew since very, very young age that dance was something that I wanted to do. I never knew initially that was gonna be something that I wanted to do as a career and something that was gonna take me so far away from home, but uh, it didn't take long. Uh, at the age of 11, uh, I got very lucky and I got a, a position into a school a ballet school in Naples, uh, in this big theater called San Carlo Ballet Theater in Naples. 
and uh, my mom was very, very courageous, and she sent me away. And so at the age of 11, I moved away from home, and I started my profession. I was already dancing in a small uh, private dance school in my hometown, but that was definitely a big jump for me, moving away from home. It was tough uh, for my mom, for me, and I mean, I, I'm pretty young, but the internet wasn't even a big thing back then. And so we had to communicate it via phone with Texas. And I remember just saying to my mom, hey, I'm here. I just got to school. I was still doing a normal uh, school in the morning. And then I was going to the ballet school in the afternoon and spending all my afternoon training. I was living in a convent with other uh, fellow dance students with me. And we were overseed by a, a person that was just keeping the group. We were 10 boys. I was the youngest. And we were ranging between age of 11 to 18. And I, I, I kind of got fostered by all these people. And they treated me really well because I was drinking my chamomile <laughs> at 10 p.m. because I really needed to go sleep. I didn't want to have a nightmare or like missing home. But um, even from a very young age, that was a great experience for me because it made me realize how much I wanted something like that, how much I wanted to be a professional ballet dancer. And in a way, even though it sounds a little silly, how much I wanted to leave home and go somewhere that was bigger and maybe better for what I was looking for. But after one year, I, I guess it was just a little too much for both my, myself and my parents, and I decided to move back home. So after moving back home, it was a little bit of a shock just because I left normal school to go to a different school. And that even though in Italy there's different way of school, but I was starting my high school year. So then I had to get back home and <clears throat> find a new place, which wasn't super easy, but it wasn't really hard at the same time. What made it difficult was actually right before leaving Naples to get back home, um, I got asked by the director of um, it's uh, the, the the big theater it's called La Scala it's in Milan and they have a very very prestigious ballet school there as every big ballet company does all over the world and the director at the time saw me in a workshop and came to me and he said you got to come with me like you got to come to the school you have to train with me and so after talking with my parents and you guys got to know, as everything in life, dance is one of the most expensive career paths that one can uh, get into. <laughs> and it doesn't really pay much, as I, I, will, I will tell you later. And it's mostly done by, by people that really want something because it's tough. But at that point, we were talking with my parents, and we knew that by going to Milan, it was going to be a very challenging uh, financially to the family. I grew up in a normal family. My dad is, and he still sells grocery, so he's that person that you'll see if you ever go to Italy in a market outdoor, and every week he goes to a different market and a different city, and he wakes up at five in the morning, and he sets everything up and he, he sells his stuff and then he gets back home and then he eats and then he goes back to work to go pick up all the vegetable and fruits from the producers and then he sells it for the day after. So we weren't very uh, rich, but we weren't poor, of course, but we knew it was going to be a bit of a challenge. But after figuring everything out, my parents decided to send me to audition for La Scala in Milan and the day of the audition, we were sure that I was going to get in because, of course, the director came to me and he said, you're getting in, like, no problem. My luggage, we had a place already. And after the audition, he comes out and he's like, something happened, we're not going to be able to get you in. <laughs> My life collapsed. Like, and I was very young, like, and uh, it was tough. I, it was tough on my mom. It was tough on everybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 
we made it through. And it was not, I mean, it's, it's emotional at this point, but it, nothing in my life happened and it was bad or anything really bad happened in my life. It's just reflecting and saying it aloud after a long time. It's just a little tough, but it's also very exciting because as you will see, it will lead me where I am today. Uh, but I moved back home. Uh, oh. Anyway. I moved back home and I was very lucky to find uh, a nice lady. She's from U uh, Romania and she used to be a professional ballet dancer in Russia. And she took me under her wing and she lived um, probably around like 45, 50 miles away from my hometown. And she trained me until the age of 17. Uh, my parents were very, very supportive from the beginning. Uh, we actually were lucky because it was the same town where my dad was going every afternoon to pick up his grocery. So <laughs> you'll see in life, and I'm sure many people can relate, things happen, but then when you look back, it's like someone is putting them all together. Like it would have been so tough for my parents to drive me somewhere else, but my dad was going there every afternoon. So it was very easy. I was still doing a normal school in the morning. I was studying in, in the car, which a lot of dancers nowadays do when they want to follow a normal education, normal education in the morning. And, um, and then every afternoon I was training. I loved it. It was a great experience because I got to train almost privately every single day. It was very tough, <laughs> I tell you. I still tell my kids, because I teach nowadays, I'm like, you guys are having it so easy when I say you're doing so good, you're so good, because my teacher didn't. Like, she made me tough, and I appreciate her for everything she's done, and she's amazing. She's, she was back then, and she's still alive, but she was 70, and she was still kicking and going, and hitting me with the remote and <laughs> calling me fat and all these kind of things but it was fine like I, that was what i needed to hear in order for me to say hey i don't care about all of this like i can do this because i really want to and uh, then a, a really weird really weird thing happened i was watching tv i've always knew since very young age that a small town was going to cut it for me. I needed to move. I needed to move somewhere bigger. I needed to move somewhere that I could express myself. I could find a job. Italy as beautiful and art, art, like a lot of heart is in Italy. There's also a big lack in the government about caring for the arts, which Unfortunately, we see it pretty much everywhere. But in Italy, you see it a lot. And I knew that dance was, wasn't going to provide me financially, but it was going to be very tough. There's only three big companies there, and I knew none of them were going to hire me. So I was watching a TV show that it's still alive. Uh, they don't have any new stuff, but I was watching this t TV show on TV called Glee. And I loved it. I just, I loved seeing people, how people live in the U.S. and how they go to school. And now, even though if you're a little different, at the end of the day, you can be accepted and you can find a path in the world, even if you come from somewhere small and you're not super rich. And I kind of got a little crush on one of the actors. And so as me, I went online and I looked for this actor and I said, let me see where this actor is from. And he was from San Francisco. I was 16 then. And I was, you know, in a, a, a starting to discover who I was. And I really knew that dance was going to have to be something that I wanted to do professionally. I wasn't sure where or how I was going to get there. But then this little light bulb lit up. I saw San Francisco. And I said, let me see what's, I didn't even know what San Francisco where. Like, I mean, I knew it was in the U.S., but I didn't know anything else so i went online and i searched big ballet schools in san francisco and little did i know the big san francisco ballet which is one of the biggest ballet company one probably the most ancient ballet company in the u.s was there and again everything aligned 
I went to talk to my mom first, and I said, Mom, there's, there's this big ballet company there, and they do audition every year. It's a summer intensive. And, you know, like if you get in, there's a big uh, tuition to pay, but if you get in, then you get a chance to get into school. And if you get into school, then you get in the company. It'll be amazing. And my mom was like, Luca, you gotta be realistic. By then, you guys have to know, I've done before 16, after le leaving uh, Naples and after getting rejected in Milan, I've done a lot of auditions. I was selected uh, three out of every Italian that applied. Only three Italian were able to go to a Royal Ballet School in London and audition for the school. And for financial reason and probably other reason, I didn't get in. And then I did other uh, uh, company uh, dance uh, ballet school audition in Italy, but they were for like I did Hamburger uh, uh, school in Germany. I don't know what to call it. Uh, that's my Italian, yeah. Uh, and other places. And I, all I got told was, Luca, you're very small. So since young age, I people told me you're very small. You're very talented. But the ballet world nowadays is evolving and they want big, beefy guy. They look good on stage. We don't want anyone short. Shorter people dance, but it's very, very lucky to find maybe one spot in a big company. So they were like, you got to be careful because it's going to be one of your problems moving forward. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> I'm just going to have to try harder and I'll find a place. But Anyway, uh, getting back into San Francisco, my mom was like, Luca, I don't think we have the financial opportunity, but we can explore this. I went to my dance teacher and she told me that she wanted to train me until the age of 17, when then it's very easy to get into a company because you, you're getting mature and usually they start hiring as a job starting at 17 years old. So I said, okay, it's fine. A couple months later, my teacher comes back and he's like, the director of San Francisco Ballet School is in Florence, which is probably like seven, eight hours of drive. You have to go and do the summer intensive. So I talked to my mom and I said, mom, I'm just gonna go for the summer intensive. We don't have to you know, do anything. There's nothing to be like commit to. I went, the second day of summer intensive, the director comes to me and he's like, you have to audition. Like, we're gonna hire you into the school we want you to audition for the summer intensive. I sent my video, and two weeks after, I got, uh, I got accepted for San Francisco Valley School summer intensive with a full scholarship. So we were incredibly excited, and my parents were able to send me. That was 2014, first time in the US, from small town in Italy, huge, long flight. I had to go through all these airports alone. I was 17. I landed in San Francisco for the summer intensive and I basically was lost. Like the jet lag, the different time zone, it's nine hours um, behind from Italy. And I was like, where am I? Like in space or something? And no English. We do speak English and we do learn English in Italy. Uh, but <laughs> as many of you probably, of those people that have been in Italy can state, Italian people don't really like to speak Ita uh, English. So it was tough. After the summer intensive, I actually got accepted in the full year of uh, training program in San Francisco with another full scholarship. Uh, we didn't get a housing, so we had to ask money around for housing, but we were able to do it and they sent me to San Francisco. It was the best year of my life, eye-opening, I turned 18 there. I didn't see my family for a full year because it would have been tough to go back and pretty expensive. But the only probably tough thing was language. I didn't speak any English. I was immensely lucky to have a roommate that was Italian, lived in San Francisco for a year before me and spoke pretty good English. So I was literally attached to the hip to this guy and he was dancing with me so it was fine and the year in San Francisco I didn't speak any English people thought that I just didn't speak honestly because I just didn't speak and but I listened I listened to everybody and when I moved back 
Unfortunately, I didn't get hired in this, into the company uh, in San Francisco because the director said, you're too small, you're too skinny, and we're not going to be able to hire you. You're not going to be able to partner girls. You're very good, but there's no fit in the company. So I moved back home, pretty sad, but I had a clear mind. I said, this is what I want to do. The U.S. is the place, and now I know how to get there. Uh, visa, it's always been a tough thing, but I was lucky enough to have first a position in Columbia, South Carolina. I got a job there for the Columbia Classical Ballet. It was a smaller company. It was my first actual contract, and I was excited to go there, but it didn't turn out as good as I thought. Paycheck was not as I expected. It was a little hard living. I lived in an apartment with a French guy, and we didn't have much money to pay rent, so we kept the heating and AC off for the whole year. And I don't know if anybody has been to South Carolina. South Carolina gets very hot, uh, even in December sometimes. And it was, it was tough, but compared to many other things, it wasn't tough. But of course, I, I slept on the floor. I didn't want to spend my money on a a frame for a mattress or a bed frame, so I had my mattress on the floor, uh, but a rice most of the time, so, but it was fine, I loved it, I, I was dancing, I was doing what I wanted, but at the end of the season, I just said, this is, this is still not what I want, like, I think I deserve better, and I can do better myself. I was lucky, again, I was very lucky to have a position from a Ukrainian company, uh, based in Kharkiv, uh, to offer me a multiple position as a freelance a dancer with their company. They take their company and they travel all over the US, and we went to China, Europe, and Belgium, and we did this tour, we came to the US, it's called Great uh, Russian Nutcracker, and they tour pretty much everywhere in the US. It was, it was an experience, I was, 1819, we did 6,000 miles on a bus and 60 performance in one month. It was, I, I mean, I define myself a pretty skinny guy and I got back home 15 pounds less than what I left and my mama said, you're not dancing anymore. <laughs> like, we are locking you in the room, we're not doing this anymore. It was, but again, I was so young, so eager to work and I said, I'm just gonna do this. We traveled in the bus, we landed from Frankfurt, we landed in Chicago and from there with a bus we did all the way up to Edmonton, uh, Canada. So we did all the that side up to Canada, we went down to Calgary, then we did, went down all the west coast, down to San Antonio, up to Chicago again where we left in a bus and food in a bus, no fridge, no toilet in the bus. And which for me, you can ask my husband, I had to go to the bathroom a lot of times to go pee. So it's just, it was something. But, and people were like, Luca, don't kill yourself. Like, don't do too much. And I'm like, people that have done this before. And I say, no, this is my time. This is when I can do it. And you never know, people in the audience, there's, there can be someone in the audience that might hire me for the future. That didn't happen. But I got a second chance with them and I went to China. And we did the same thing, it was a little better, it was two weeks, eight performances, and we travel on a plane, because China is much bigger. And, but I got to see China, and I was only 20. Then we went to Belgium, then we went to Netherlands, we went to Italy, went to France, went to so many places, and I kept telling myself, this is the best job that one can have. But it was very tiring. I knew it was time for me to find a place that I could call home that wasn't my actual home. So a new company in, so uh, in Charleston, South Carolina was forming. And they had this idea of hiring people all different height, weight, and they wanted to be diverse. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, this is perfect. This is my company. I'm not going to hear you're too small or too skinny again. So I applied, they were just forming, and they hired me, and they said, you're gonna have to do your own visa because we're not gonna be able to sponsor you. That uh, usually a visa, it's around five to $10,000 to get into the US, and that will probably get you for like one or two years. Uh, that was all the money that I gathered from my tours I had to put for a visa, which was fine, 
uh, it was a little challenging because you have to kind of gather all your life experience from when you're born to when you're applying and have all the documentation. My paperwork for visas, it's always been around 10 to 15 pounds because you have to pretty much have everything. Like they need to know every single thing. Like you moved left that day, that's, they need to know it. Documentation, documentation, letter of recommendation. I applied for it, the company closed right before my visa got approved. They didn't refund me the money. The company went MIA. Everybody left, and I told my mom. I was 20, I believe, at that time, and I remember blowing my birthday candle, uh, and I told my mom, I don't want to go to the U.S. anymore. Like, this is tough. Like, going to the U.S., I have to pay for a visa, and then this happens. I'm not going to do this anymore. I had a little bit of money left uh, from my tours, so I said, I'm just going to put myself on a plane, make a journey, and go pretty much everywhere I can in Europe and audition. I went to Spain, France, England. I did once 25, 24 hours on a bus to go to Czech Republic. I did an audition and two hours later I did 24 hours back on a bus. It was, when I keep telling my husband the story, it was something that I will never even imagine to do now. I'm like, no, don't put me in a bus for an hour let alone 24, but audition pretty much everywhere. Same answer. Very good, but very short. We're not going to hire you. That was devastating. I was 21, didn't have a diploma because to move to San Francisco, I had to quit school. My school wouldn't allow me to graduate unless I was physically in Italy. And I didn't know enough English to apply for a school here. Uh, I was devastated. I called my mom. I remember I was a niece, friends, and I just got caught by this big audition in the middle of the audition. And I kept looking around and I was like, these people are no as good as me. And I'm a pretty humble person, as much as humble can be. Uh, and I told my mom, I said, I cannot believe these people kept going just because they're taller than me. My mom was crying on the phone. We're very emotional. Italian people are very emotional. Me, me and my mom were very emotional. And she just goes, maybe this is not your path. Maybe this is not what you have to do in life. Uh, I had friends in New York. I was very lucky to find a family that hosted me every time I went to New York for auditions. And I said to my mom, look, I have these little money left. I'm going to try to go there for a weekend just to say goodbye because I know I'm not going to go back to the U.S. Probably going to reapply for school in Italy and leave everything. And... I was there in the hotel in Nice before I left for Italy and I was looking for flights and I found, found this flight leaving two days after um, to go to New York from Rome, $300 round trip, which I don't think I will ever find it again. I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do to deserve $300 round trip ticket to go to New York? And I called my mom, I said, mom, I'm coming back home tomorrow and then the day after tomorrow I'm leaving back going to New York for three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, coming back on Monday morning. This is what, how much I paid. I'm just going to go say goodbye to these friends and, you know, start a new life back home. But in the meantime, I was still very hopeful that something was going to come up. And I told my mom, let me see what's there in New York. Because New York, and that was March. New York, it's a big, big hub where all the companies all over the, U the world go and audition every March. Nashville Ballet was there. And I'm like, okay, well, I did Nashville Ballet the, day, the year before, and I almost got a contract. The director didn't have a spot with enough money to sponsor my visa, because they do sponsor visas, and he didn't hire me. So maybe he'll remember me. I went to New York, went to the audition, wasn't expecting much after all of this. I was ready, ready to you know, start a new life, as painful as it sounded. And well, I did a Nashville Ballet audition and I got a contract. And it was life changing. I, I just remember receiving that call because you audition, usually the things that happen, you audition for a company, you get through a selection during the audition. So you start with like two, 300 people. Usually in New York, that's the case where you're like one next to each other at the ball. I'm like, oh my God, am I going to kick someone and get yelled at too? And then every 
five to ten minutes, they start cutting people and they call names. You have uh, numbers. You have numbers written up. We were probably ten people from 200 at the end, and out of ten people, probably they hire one, if if so. And I remember the director calling me two or three weeks after, saying, "Luca, we." we're ready to offer you a contract like you're in we're going to sponsor your visa you're coming in in june i was <laughs> somewhere else i was like oh my gosh this is amazing like this is life changing when i was ready to turn page and move into something else a new opportunity presented and there i was june 20 2018 i moved to nashville it was great. I, first of all, I didn't know by moving to Nashville, my life was going to change forever. <laughs> like, I, I mean, my life changed, changed every time I took a bad turn. Every time something happened, new thing happened and better than before. And I went to Nashville. I loved it. Finally, I had a place that I knew I was going to call home. I knew I was going to live there for a long time. I knew I was able to decorate my apartment, maybe get a dog. And I got my first car. I was driving this little small, people were making fun of me, even my husband when we met. He was like, what are you driving? I was driving a two seats uh, smart car. And <laughs> in Italy, yes, in Italy, you guys, we have very, very small cars. I used to drive a Fiat two seats. And my dad had a whole Fiat, like a very, very small old Fiat. So we drive very small car. Uh, but yeah, I was very excited. Everything was going amazing. I stayed there for three seasons, uh, which means I started in 2018 and I stayed there until 2021. But again, uh, as I always say, things in life happen for a reason. Sometimes we don't understand it. Sometimes we're very mad when they're happening. Sometimes we're very happy when they're happening. We don't see the bigger picture. How can we? Like nobody sees the future, right? But in 2019, uh, I was dancing. Uh, I was overdoing so much. I was killing myself, basically, because people were saying, Luca, you have to get stronger. You have to go to the gym because you need to be able to lift dancer, female dancers, because we want to put you. The director really believed in me, in me. And he said, for me to make you dance the roles that you deserve to dance, you need to be able to partner a girl. I started going to the gym, I was working out, at the same time I was dancing. And life as a ballet dancer, professional ballet dancer, is you wake up at eight, you go to ballet class starting at nine, and you dance until six. Performance and stuff. But there wasn't even enough money for me to live in Nashville, which is a very expensive city, which I didn't know when I moved there. So I was also teaching every single night after that. Um, so I was, my body was feeling it. Uh, a dress rehearsal before, two days before opening night of Nutcracker in 2019. I did a big, big jump on my solo. I was doing Russian dance and I tore my ACL and I fell. I didn't scream. I didn't cry. I didn't say anything. The only thing I said, I said, I broke something. Like I knew. I knew because I felt the pop. I knew it inside. It was... Uh, it was a little weird, especially when you are a dancer, you feel like you're invincible. And I've seen people getting injured, a lot of people getting injured. But I always thought I was invincible. Nothing is going to happen to me. Everything is going to work. And then it happened. Uh, the injury made me see everything in a different way, made me see ballet world very differently. I really understood how I was treated, even though the director loved me and loved working with all the dancers. I felt like I was just a piece of meat that got moved out and replaced. Nobody cared. I lived alone at the time. I needed eyes. I had one leg that I wasn't, I actually had to re start learning how to walk from the beginning. I went from flying on stage to learning how to walk. I wasn't able to get into bathtub and I lived alone. I had a friend that had to come every couple of days and help me shower which was pretty embarrass embarrassing from like a point of view where like you can literally go from like flying on stage to like having to ask people help to like step up a bathtub. 
But even that, it just made me see things completely different. Get a perspective of, oh my gosh, I'm starting from scratch. Until that point, I was Luca the dancer. Dance got completely out of the picture. Recovery took 11 months. And in this 11 months, I got to see so many other things. And I was like, oh my gosh, until the age of 21, all I did was dancing. I didn't have time for anything else. I always loved photography. I always took photos of myself. It's always been tough for me to find a photographer that knew dance and that I could trust and to just do my things and have the photographer catch everything. As I'll mention in a little bit, dance photography is a little challenging because it's not just having to put all the right settings and lighting and equipment in place, it's also having to know dance. It's also having to understand when's the peak and not getting the dancer tired, having to ask the dancer to repeat the movement so many times because you guys, it's hard. It is hard. I've been on the other side and now I'm on the other side of the lens and I can attest that. So I, in this 11 months, I really discovered a lot of things about myself. Plus I met my husband. He was in Nashville, he was visiting, and we ate it up and we got really close. It was COVID time, it was 2020, and I wasn't working because I was recovering. He wasn't working either. We spent a lot of time and after a little bit of traveling and stuff, we decided to get married. He's from here, from Ohio, and he got his offer back, job offer back, and he said, Luca, what do you think about moving to Ohio. And I was like, what is Ohio? <laughs> I'm like, I, I didn't know what San Francisco was, so let alone what Ohio was, right? Yeah, right? I mean, there's beautiful places that I, and, and here, there, there really is. And I go back to Nashville Ballet in September 2020, 2020, and I went dancing. Like, as soon as I got back, they put me back dancing. I was like, you guys got to be kidding me. They actually, first performance that I did was the same dance that I tore my ACL in. And I'm like, you guys got to be kidding me. Like, you, you don't see a pattern. But I loved it. I still loved it. Even though I knew something was changing, I loved it. Then when we decided to move, when he decided that he wanted to move back here and he asked me, I say, listen, maybe this can be a good opportunity for me to just start fresh. I don't think I can dance anymore. Not because of my knee. I was back stronger than ever because in the 11 months, I really got to focus on step by step rebuilding my whole body from zero to a hundred percent. And I loved it. I was stronger than ever, but I just didn't have that will. And in dance, as I mentioned, in everything, if you don't have that passion and drive, it's not that it's a job that pays you a million dollars. I will do that. The, the, no, I was still struggling financially. So I knew that something was switching. So I moved back. We moved to Ohio. And I said, so what am I going to do in my life? Like, I've always been Luca the Dancer. That's all I know. That's all I've done. I have no education. I have no anything else. And I initially transitioned into teaching s dance schools. And they loved it. Like, they were like, oh, you're a great asset. There's no ballet teachers here. You have a great experience. You're fresh out of the boat. You're young. You can show it. And I loved it. I still do teach dance. But I still, fe still felt that something was missing. I, had a, I bought a couple months before an older, which is not an older, uh, Nikon. Um, it's a D5600. And yeah, and I loved it. It, I, it was working for me. I took a little pictures, S you know, I didn't know anything. I loved photography because I, again, I used to put my phone there, put it on a timer, pose and do photos of myself, take photos for the companies with my phone. I never had that much money to actually afford the camera. But when I did, after I, we moved here, I got it. We went to the zoo and took a couple of photos. I felt so fancy with my camera. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at me a photographer. And, <clears throat> but then I put it aside start teaching and my life was evolving. And then one day we do have three dogs and it's the joy of our lives. And uh, my husband asked me, why don't you just take a couple of photos with your camera of our dogs? And I did and didn't work. And then I was like, wait, let me put a couple of lights. And 
I bought like those bulbs. I didn't know anything. So I bought bulbs and I put those bulbs to take photos and I was like, oh, okay. Well, and I started working with Aperture. I moved from manual to, from um, uh, uh, automatic to manual. And I was like, okay, well, I can start seeing it. YouTube, it was amazing friend to me. And yeah, everything, everything. And we took those three beautiful portraits of our dogs. I got a backdrop, savage blue backdrop, uh, got a stand, and I took those photos. Then I got a, a, a it's a GMV brand um, LED light, and I started taking some photos. I got a ginormous um, modifier that I put on top. It's like one of those like very, very big modifier that you open and they clip open and close. And I put it on top. I took photos of one of our friend's dogs and I, I started pay getting paid. And then I was still teaching. So I said, how about I take my camera and I try to play around in the studios that I teach. So after classes, I used to ask the girls, take this, do this jump or do this other jump. And I used to take photos and all the girls were like, oh my gosh, Luca, you're amazing. We don't have anyone here that at first try can take pictures that quick and that wasn't because I was good at photography it was because I know when the peak was because I was right there I, I knew what a jump should look like so that's what I was waiting for and then it took me a couple of tries to kind of get the shutter speed which took him a little to understand the higher the shutter speed the more the faster you can close and the faster you can get the shot but once I did I started receiving texts and this little guy I was used to teach, her mom texted me and she was like, and until then I did everything for free. I wasn't gonna charge for someone that didn't have experience and you know, just playing with the camera. And then this mom reached out to me and she was like, Luca, can I hire you to take my kid dance photo? And I was like, oh my God. And I tell you guys, I had this blue, light blue savage backdrop with these two stands that I don't even know how they hold the backdrop bought it from Amazon. They, they were like moving like this when it went up. And then with lights, I still kept those little bulbs that I bought. And I was like, why it doesn't even work? So I was like getting them close. The pictures actually turn out really good. Don't show them often. I'll show you a couple of my photos in a little bit. And from there, it just, my husband said, open your LLC. And I think you can actually do something with this. January 2022, I opened my LLC. I bought a, made a huge investment. And I, you guys, you guys know photography is, it's no cheap. It's no cheap. Absolutely not. And I like gears. I love gears. When it comes to new things, I like it. And I bought a Nikon Z9 as soon as it came out. And I loved it. I said, this is the camera for me. This can capture. At that point, YouTube was probably my best friend. How to, it was my very first thing that popped on the YouTube search. Because I didn't go to school for photography. I learned everything I know from YouTube and people that were very kind to put everything out there in YouTube, on YouTube. And I was able to learn from there. I got experience in Photoshop thanks to people that teach you stuff in Photoshop. I didn't even know what Photoshop was until then. And now I can do a lot of things on Photoshop. I don't consider myself a good Photoshop editor, especially when I see those big editors out there. But I know at least it works with my workflow, which I'll mention in a little bit. I decided to invest. I got lenses. I got Profoto gears. I got backdrops. I got stands, which I, I can give you a few names because again, I love gears. And dance photography, it's something that requires, in my opinion, especially inside studio dance photography, it's something that requires very fast flash. Uh, F1, the ra F1 uh, of a flash needs to be very fast. I knew Profoto was probably the best brand for me to go to. Nikon was a choice of my first camera. I follow through with, uh, I follow with a Ni the Z9. I didn't have a choice why I chose Nikon. I guess it was just very popular in Italy and that's why I picked up a Nikon camera initially. And then I had Nikon flashes, so I was like, okay, well, that's fine. Then I moved into Profoto. And then from there, one thing led to another 
And in less than a year, which it's been probably a year and a half since I actually started my photography, big photography journey, I have people contacting me for, from like three, four hours away driving up to Akron to get photos with me. And I'm so extremely, extremely humbled, excited, and happy about every single little thing that happened in my life that even though looking back, I'm like me ending up as a dance photographer in Akron, Ohio, I would have, I mean, I knew I liked photography. I knew that I wanted to have dance involved in my life, but I never knew that that was going to lead me to this. But every single little thing, and I know things are still evolving. I'm still discovering myself. It's like I was reborn when I left my dancing career, and I'm still discovering so many other hobbies that I like. And I'm like, Luca, you gotta stop because, like, now you gotta focus on something. And I know photography is something that I really want to do. I do not own a studio. We were extremely uh, fortunate when we bought a house in Akron two years ago, a couple months before I got into photography, that we have this ginormous living room, which is not our living room anymore because I moved everything away. And I'll show you a video in a little bit on how I set typically. And that was when we had furniture. After a couple of months, I decided to tell my husband that we were taking all the furniture out and moving somewhere else as a living room. But it's a 13 um, foot ceiling hide and it's pretty long. And for dance photography, you need, I usually use a 24 to 70, just because it's not very long. Uh, I usually sometimes use a 70 to 200, which is my go-to lens to use when I do um, stage performance photography. That's probably the best in 2.8 as aperture. Um, but the 24 to 70 works best in a little bit narrower em environment. And lights need to be hanged all the way on top. The best light for a dancer when it comes to dance photography is a lighting that comes from above because it really sculpts the body. Um, it's not that typical light that you use for portrait that kind of shows the face and kind of gives, gives you a little softer on the face, but it's a light that can give you a little bit more sculpture. Now, while I talk, we can probably go through photos and yeah, you can just go a little bit there. So here's a photo. Actually, this is a photo of me. And <laughs> after setting everything up, I asked my wonderful husband, which is not a photographer, to take a couple of photos of me. I have, a, and I'll tell you the name, because again, there's a lot of things. I bought this stand, which might, some people might know. It's a big, big stand. Let me see if I can find it. I still don't know the name of my gears, of course. Um, mm -hmm. It, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a big stand. Oh, here, it's called Studio Titan. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. It's a big stand on wheels and has two arms. You put a camera and a laptop and then it just moves up and down. So I had everything set up. I told my husband, you go, just sit down. He was eating chips. I said, sit down. <laughs> you just have to click the camera and focus on me because Nikon Z9 is very good on face recognition. I put my lights, the photo lights are very good uh, because you can just leave the um, uh, modeling light on and so the focus it's easier you can see what's happening for this photo I had an um, octobus octobox on top of me with grids and then I had two strip boxes on the side so the octobox is the one that you see a light on my face and the strips is something that I usually put as a dance photography and I'll show you in other photos to kind of sculpt the face and separate the face the, the body from the backdrop because one thing that I say in photography in general, but especially dance photography, and my goal in dance photography is to create a photo that even though it's a two dimension, it can actually give you an impression that it's popping out of that image. It's a three dimension, because dance, as everything, it's a three dimension. I want to convey a movement into a single shot, into a single frame, and what's the best way to do so? Yes, it's the movement. Yes, it's the dancer. Yes, it's the photographer. But it's especially lighting. I'm incredibly picky when it comes to lighting. And I do 99% of my work indoor. 
And when I go out outdoor, people think I'm crazy because I carry at least one big light with an octobox on top and I have to go like everywhere with this light and I look like a crazy person. But anyway, my husband took this photo and I can move, we can move faster into the other photos. I do photos of little kids. So when it comes to little kids, I usually like to go with a lighter backdrop, something that can kind of show, you know, uh, a little brighter and stuff like that. Th this is the same thing. And I work a lot with dance schools. I teach in dance schools. So my, m I'm very lucky where dance schools call me. And during recitals, I set everything up. I put all my gears in the car. And then I set everything up there. And we take photos and, you know, all the kids. But I do a lot of stuff at my house as individual uh, packages. And this is the same occasion with an older girl. And you know, move forward. This is, I do a lot of audition photos as well. Like when it comes to people auditioning, uh, they come to me and they're like, I want to do audition. And I've been there. I know what an audition and people are looking for audition. So I can pose them. It's very important. My way of taking photos, I usually set myself low. With this stand, I'm able to go as low as probably this low. I set myself down, tilt the camera up. That way you can actually give that everybody wants to look longer and skinnier in dance. That's the, that's the thing. But that way you can actually give a little bit more of a lo length on the legs and the body and the dancer looks better. But therefore, when I have a camera lower, everything looks like I'm leaning back because everything, it's taken from the armpit. So very important, what, what I tell my kids and my, my students and my clients is that you got to imagine of dancing and uh, taking photos. And when you take photos of dance, of being in between two very tight walls, everything needs to be almost on the same plate because everything closer to the camera will look bigger, everything farther away. So therefore, if the girl had their le her left arm behind a little more, that would have looked misproportioned and smaller than the right arm. So it's a very specific kind of thing. My photo shoots don't go uh, less than an hour and a half, two hours. And even then, I like to keep it longer because for one pose like this, we probably spend a good 30 minutes. And the girl is amazing. We just wanted to get the best shot and everything and there's a way to get there there's not just her going up but yeah and usually you pick a white i do a lot of headshots and portrait work as well i'm really into more of like a um, i would say when i do work for myself of a client comes to me and it says luca just be you and do your photo one thing that i like it's contrast sharpness and I like a little darker tones. I do some black and whites as well, which I think I have here. Um, I do a lot of like different stuff. I have this project that I started a couple months ago. It's called Forza Elegante, which is Italian, and it means elegant strength. And what I'm trying to portray in those photos is uh, the strengthness. I go around and I ask male ballet dancers to come and take photos for me. And what I'm trying to create is photos that show strengthness of a male body, male dancer, with the elegance of their movement and dance and wardrobe and stuff like that. So these are kind of, I love skirt playing and the way the fabric can move around. I uh, most often use a fan which sometimes can get a little messy, especially if people don't know what they're doing, but this, there's always guidance. Um, so this is a dancer from Cleveland Ballet. Uh, we took some hatches for him. And this is another girl that came to me and she was like, I want to do photos. And she did audition photos. That actually was one of my first clients that really opened my, my vision up. And I said, I, I can actually do this. Sometimes you also want to have a good model to actually see better photos. And she then came back and we did these photos, which I think turned out really good and I really liked them. And this is some more of her. And she now dances a Pittsburgh ballet. And this is another guy from Cleveland ballet. And this is, uh, probably this is one of the best example. Now the photos on the screen are a little more contrasty than the actual uh, one, I guess, yeah, I guess it's just the screen over there. But uh, this is probably the best example where you can see a very strength, like strong muscle body of a guy into a split that 
even myself at this point, at this point, no, don't, not sure if, if I can do it, but, or something like this, where we can put someone like him in fabric. Same, this is the same guy. This was another project that I did. And all these backdrops are, like the backdrop that you saw before was a beige, savage backdrop. I love using a uh, uh, paper backdrop. They're easy. Uh, if they get dirty, you cut them off. You don't uh, Photoshop. I do a lot of Photoshop, but when I say I do a lot of Photoshop, it means when I, I don't have a before photo, but when I get a photo, usually there is some sort of texture in the backdrop. I take all my photos tethered to Capture One. While I'm in Capture One, I'm already making adjustments. I go ahead and Capture One. I don't know if anyone is familiar with Capture One. It's a software similar to Lightroom where you tether your camera to it. And while you take photos, they go immediately into the screen, uh, into Capture One. And I usually have two screens. I have my laptop where I tether to, and then I have a second screen that I connect my laptop to so my clients can see the photos coming in live. So if I have to make any suggestion, I say, look at the, I point on my laptop and you can see it, they can see on the screen and let's fix this photo or let's do this other thing. On Capture One, I already readjust my exposure. I use a white card or gray card as a, a reference for uh, white balance when I work with uh, indoor photography. And then from there I make adjustment. But after that, I go ahead on Photoshop, I cut the person out, take the backdrop, re-clean all the backdrop because I need the clean, smooth look. And one of my bad things is that I compare myself to like the big, big photographers. I wish I could compare myself to like photographers like me, but I go ahead and look at New York photographers, best photographer in the dance world. And then I see my photo and I'm like, what am I doing? So I try to do more and I try to do best and I try to learn from them. So I do a lot of retouching on the backdrop when it comes to body. I don't do much. Blemishes, yes. I maybe retouch skin. Sometimes I redo coloring. And through Photoshop, it's pretty easy when it comes to auctions. Sometimes I, I buy auctions where they already have it, or I just go ahead on to the colors and just modify. But that's all based on my personal uh, preferences and what I like. This is the two guys, and we did this which I thought was beautiful photo. It took us probably an hour to get this, the right symmetry of the, the body. And this is some black and white. I got this beautiful smoke machine and I really wanted to try. I didn't even know how to use it yet. It's called Smoke Genie. And it's like this little thing and it just goes on with smoke and smoke and smoke. So I tried to take a couple of those and this is for the project that I'm you know, working on. Same for that too. This was a little A's, as you can see, I don't know if it shows a little bit in the image, on the side. And most of my lighting uh, techniques is usually a light on the top. I put my Profoto B10X. I used to put a D2. I don't know if anyone knows. A D2, it's very heavy. I got a big, big heavy duty stand that goes up to 13 feet and then I attach it. Uh, it's, it's high. Sometimes I'm scared and for me it's safety first. I touched this big boom arm um, from Combo, Comba, and it extends, and it's a very heavy duty. I put 30 pound sandbags on one side, and then a light with a seven foot um, umbrella, white umbrella with the fuser on top. That's usually my go-to with the light on top, and then I can just adjust the tilt to get more or less light on the backdrop, and then I usually have at least two strip boxes on the side. And that's what you see on the side as a light for the haze and everything coming out. Same thing. To get this shape of the skirt, sometimes I do have to adjust on Photoshop, but I actually had a guy behind him that throw the skirt and he just got on the pose. And I was actually able to cut the guy out. You don't even see the guy behind, but things we do to get a good shot. Yeah. This is me, and th this is a picture that my husband took. And I was just moving around again. And I told my husband just, just shoot, just take photos and let's see what happens. This is a portrait that I did with one of my very good friends and I loved it. And from there I actually started uh, taking portraits. I now take also um, senior photos, which I think it's very good uh, experience. You get to know a lot of seniors and what they're going through. And I do a lot of 
outdoor photography that way because otherwise Zen's usually takes me indoor with backdrops. And this, I love this photo because everything that you see was actually created live. Like I didn't have to make anything up on Photoshop. I, one of my biggest, biggest photographer that I look up to, it's Lindsay Adler. I don't know if anyone heard of her. And she created this optical uh, spot. It's um, just a light modifier that you put on top of your uh, strobe. And then you put a little lens on top. And then there's gobos go between that have shapes. And basically, by working the gobos, I was able to just create the shape on her face. It just almost looked like a tattoo. And everything else was not lit, as you can see. And then I lit the backdrop completely lit the backdrop completely to create a silhouette. And then I just put that little light on her face to create almost that tattoo. And then I wanted to almost had, and sometimes I have ideas. Sometimes I'm like ahead and sometimes I'm like, okay, let's just see what happens. And we were playing around and I'm like, just hit this pose almost like a Egyptian one or like some, everything you'll see, even when I do portrait photography. And I'm sorry for like people that are no dancers. Most of the times my portrait clients and senior photo clients are no dancer. And then I tell them, stand like this or do this. And they're like, what are you doing? Like, we're no dancers. And I'm like, but I know, but like, that's me. Like, you'll know. And this is a, uh, we did this photo shoot. He's a dance teacher, but clearly is a very good dancer. And this is another project of mine that I did. And it's, as you can see, this is more of like, if you ask me to do me, I'll take photos like this more. I just like the darkness and the contrast in photos. I don't know. I guess maybe we'll change. I don't know. We'll see. Same thing here. Same here. Actually, what I had, and this is a white backdrop. What I did, I just lit him from the back. Very light to create the shape on the jacket. You really wanted to highlight this jacket. And everything else was black. All, everything else was no lid. And that's what I love about indoor photography in general. I, and I don't consider myself only a dance photographer because I will want to shoot sh um, fashion and more portraits kind of stuff because I just love playing with lights. That's why you'll see me 99% indoor rather than outdoor. Outdoor, there's so many other beautiful things. You get to play with the sun and all that kind of things. But indoor, I get to create my light. And until that moment, until I moved into photography, I always got to do what my director told me. I did do my things, but here I'm my director. Like, I don't have any bosses. I mean, except my husband sometimes. But like, I get to create the light that I want and from there tell a story. And we're almost done. This is, again, white backdrop. Uh, I work with like uh, dressmakers. Uh, the she, the, this person makes dresses and uh, dance costume and she was a model for us. Seven hours photo shoot. It was a long, long one, but I love it. And this is me. Now, if we go on videos before I finish, I want to actually show you. And this is a very quick time lapse of uh, last year. And you won't be able to see much of the gear, but this is what I had to do before actually getting everything cleaned up in my living room. And yes. So it's a very quick time lapse of this is our living room before we moved all our furniture. So I used to just move everything. We don't have curtains on the window and that light really pops into, the, into where I used to put the backdrop. So I had to close all the, and put all the curtains up and stuff. Clean, because we have three dogs, so yeah. <laughs> Hair everywhere, even when you clean. So it probably used to take me around an hour and a half to two hours to set and take down, plus the photo shoot. Now it takes me a little less because there's nothing there. I just have to set everything up. I still have to set everything up. But that's when people ask, why is this so expensive? I would like to show them that video or videos that I make now and be like, it's, it, it is expensive because there's a lot of things. But it's, as you guys can probably test and you know, probably back up on this, Photography is such a great thing and whatever you do in photography, whatever kind of photography you do, it's an art form that I don't want to be 
going away because I always tell my clients through those photos, you're going to look back. And I have kids that don't want to take the photos, are forced by the mom. And I'm like, you're going to look at those photos back in a couple of years and be like, oh my gosh, that's what I was. That's wh like, that's how literal I was. Oh, that's my senior photos. Moments that you're not going to be able to get back. Like, uh, we don't have any other way to then look back if it's not a video and have those things. So that's, I tell, if you want to invest into something, it's one in a lifetime thing that you have to do, invest into photography. And first of all, help us pay for those gears, <laughs> 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 but also invest in yourself. So, and this is all I have. And I appreciate you guys listening to me. I know probably something different, but thank you so much for having me here wow. again. Thank you. Oh, that was phenomenal. That is, that was really phenomenal. I mean, that, that thank Luca, thank that you. is great. We have any questions from the audience? Oh, no, quit, no dancers <laughs> here. Uh, nothing. You are, okay. Here, take the the mics so the people at home. Um, yeah, I have two. Uh, I have two dancers. Uh, my my daughters just got done with uh, with their Nutcracker, oh, and okay. um, since I've taken up photography, I've gotten permission to next time photograph their their dress rehearsals and that. Perfect. What, uh, you have any any tips for the uh, for the newbie theater, uh, stage photography? Well, definitely fast shutter speeds. <laughs> fast shutter speed. Uh. I, I would say go and before you go look at the photo, before you go take photos, I will definitely say if you can, go one other time to kind of get comfortable with what's happening. So you know, I don't use super fast shutter speed when I take dance photography in the theater. Lights will always change. Don't know what, like in a cracker, I don't know how many light changing they have, but then once you think you have a set, that's when it happens that it gets all dark. So go see it so you don't have to have such a, uh, high shutter speed definitely 800 it's the minimum the, don't go lower than that because you're going to start getting a little blurry I another suggestion I love tethering like I usually tether even when I go to the theater so I get my tethering cable I grab it I put it on my laptop I open this either Lightroom or um, Capture One that way even if the photos are darker what I usually do I take a couple of photos right at the beginning edit everything up, create a kind of a preset, and then even though the pictures are coming darker, because what you want, you want a sharp photo. Even if it's a little darker, then in post-processing, you can do it, you can change it. But definitely maybe get familiar with what's happening and settings. Settings I will probably be put, if you're just photographing one person, probably the lowest shot, uh, the lower F stop that you have and a little higher shutter speed and then compensate with the, um, ISO, or if you have to put photograph more people, then you just put a little bit of higher uh, f stop, so you at least get a little bit more people in focus. But definitely get familiar with the the show, so at least you know, which well, I'm sure you are, because probably you go see them every year. Yeah, well, so uh, probably you can dance in it. That's what I tell my parents. For him, the kids. while he's while he's doing that, you know, using an 800 or whatnot, what ISO do you usually wind up at? I, I usually in stay the below the 1,000. You're usually lower than 1,000? Yeah. And that's why I feather. Because by feathering, even if the pictures are darker, what I do, I just go and capture one. I bump up the exposure. I go a little few tweaks, mayb maybe clarity, maybe go a little bit more structure, open up a little the light, the brightness. And then I have those photos immediately going into my laptop, edited. Like it's a live thing. Like as soon as I discover, you guys, if you don't use feathering and sometimes you have problems, that it's a life changing. Even nowadays, I would rather have a sharper image. I put a higher F stop and the pictures are a little darker, but my clients won't even see it because I immediately make the tweaks. And as soon as I take the photo, the photo will be immediately edited. And what you see, it's already edited. And they doesn't, it doesn't take any quality away. what you'll do is take a photo before any of the action starts you pr you pre-make your uh your settings mm -hmm. 
and then every photo after that basically yeah is, we'll do we'll follow oh, we'll follow. Okay. then if there's a light changing then what i do if i have time because when you do photos on uh, i mean uh, when i get hired uh, the the studios are like we need two thousand photos and i'm like <laughs> like and also a, a thing that i can tell you if you can do it you put a burst mode like take multiple photos. If you're not able to just capture it, I, I do I do it myself too, because I never know. I'm not able to ask the dancer, can you jump again? Like while they're performing. But yeah, I take the photos and then they will just be edited live, which it's incredible. I thought you were editing them as each one. Oh no, oh no. No, you need th three in people in next burst to mode. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no. Any, any other questions? Anything? Yes. Let me keep I noticed in the photos where the feet are touching the floor, mm -hmm. in the dance photos, you have a very nice shadow mm -hmm. from their feet. So are you doing special lighting on the feet too? Are you adding it in post? Uh, I do not light it like shadows in post because I actually try to clean it. When I clean the backdrop, I just cut the person so the shadow will actually get reduced, but it's, it's not hard shadow. What I do, I usually just either feather the light, put a grid on the, on the soft box that I use, or keep it farther or closer away in order to. Now, we must say, the photo, for example, of the girl all in white in a pose like this, where the shadow was, and she was lit everywhere, I had a, um, um, umbrella, seven foot umbrella on top that was lighting mostly the backdrop. Then I had a light from behind here. It was a strip box, no, only strip box, no grid. Then I had a big seven foot uh, soft box in front of her face. And the bigger, the bigger the light, the softer the light, right? So I usually go bigger lights when I want something softer. And therefore, that big seven foot was able to lit everything and create a very slight shadow so that wasn't gonna be distracted. And definitely no shadow on the backdrop. So I usually keep my dancers a little farther away, at least a couple of feet away from the backdrop. So even though there is shadow, it won't project up to the backdrop. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of things that you see, once you see it, then you <laughs> make the mistake. And then you're like, okay, well, I'll do better next time. <laughs> Any other questions? Luca, I, I just can't tell you. We've had a lot of speakers here. This was phenomenal. Oh, I, I mean, not only your story, but I am amazed since you took a photography in that short time, basically self-taught with YouTube. And these are just absolutely incredible images. I appreciate so that. So I, I am really amazed. So thank we, you so we much. can't, we really thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. And if you even want to go see my website or know a little bit more about myself, I left some like uh, uh, business cards and a little, it's a bigger business cards too, if you guys want to. And you'll find everything there, uh, Instagram, Facebook, my website. But I really, really appreciate you guys having me here. First time. And I had such a great time. I, I apologize for the crying. But oh, we <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. So thank please, you. and do take a look, because I was on his website. He has some cards on the back, the silver table. So pick it up and take a look. So thanks thank you. again, Luca. Thank you, guys. Thank you.